A very good evening aspirants. Welcome again to the Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the day 6th of December 2021. So these are the list of news articles that we will be discussing in today's discussion and they are provided along with the page numbers of different editions and also the link for the handwritten notes in PDF format as well as the time stamping of the different articles are given below in the description box for your reference. So you can make a note of it. So come let us get into our discussion for today. Now look at this picture. As you can see here, this picture displays the scenic view of the Shikara Rally in the Dal Lake which is located in Srinagar. Now based on this context, let us take this as an opportunity to learn about the Dal Lake and also its related aspects which will be useful for us in our exam perspective. The syllabus covered by this article is highlighted here for your reference. So first let us begin with Dal Lake. Know that the word Dal in Kashmiri language is lake. So that means both Dal Lake refers to the same word that is lake. See this Dal Lake is actually an urban lake which is located in Srinagar. So when you take this term urban lake, it is generally used to refer to those lakes which are located within the limits of a city. So since they are within city limits, they will be directly surrounded by urban developments. And most of them also have recreation facilities like that of parks and playgrounds limited to their shoreline area. So coming back, this Dal Lake is a very famous place for tourism and also for recreation in Kashmir. It is so famous that it is named as the Jewel in the Crown of Kashmir or it is also known as Srinagar's Jewel. So this lake is not only an important tourist spot but it is also an important source for fishing and water plant harvesting. When you look at this Dal Lake, it is actually lined with Mughal era gardens, various parks, then houseboats and also hotels and the scenic view of the lake can be seen from the Mughal gardens such as the Shalimar Bagh as well as the Nishad Bagh. And note that these Mughal gardens were built during the reign of the Mughal emperor Jahangir. So uh, people generally use the houseboats which are sailing here along this lake to view these scenic beauties and these houseboats has also got the facilities to provide accommodation for the tourist. Know that the temperature of this lake during the winter season will sometimes even reach minus 11 degrees Celsius. So the temperature here will get so cold that it leads to the freezing of this lake. Also note that this Dal Lake is a part of a natural wetland. See, we all know that wetlands are areas where the water covers the soil or where the water is present either at or near the surface of the soil throughout the year or for varying periods of time during the year including the growing season. So when you take natural wetlands, they are ecosystems that are either permanently or seasonally saturated in water. So the natural wetland in which this Dal Lake is a part covers an area of about 21.1 square kilometers. So this 21.1 square kilometers also include the wetlands floating gardens and these floating gardens are referred with the term Rad which is a word from the Kashmiri language. So generally these floating gardens they blossom with lotus flowers during the month of July and August. See, as I told you, this Dal Lake is a very famous tourist spot and it is famous mainly because of its Shikara Rally. See, in Kashmiri language, the word Shikara means houseboat. If you could recollect, you would have also come across this term Shikara when you study art and architecture. Yes, you are right. So, this term Shikara is a word which is used to refer to the superstructure or the tower or spire which are constructed above the sanctuary and also above the pillared mandapas. And uh, this is one of the most dominant and also a characteristic feature of the Hindu temple in the north. So, just remember Shikara has got two contexts. One is it means a houseboat in the Kashmiri language and the other context is that it is used to refer to a particular style of architecture which is a dominant feature of the Hindu temple in the north. 
So coming back, even recently, a grand Shikara rally was actually organized by our tourism department in the Dal Lake in Srinagar, and this rally was organized in connection with the celebration of the birth anniversary of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So generally, what happens is during this rally and all, the Shikaras will be traditionally decorated, and these decorated Shikaras will then uh, pass through several scenic spots of the. Dal Lake. So this is how the rally actually goes on. So as I told you in the beginning, this uh, Dal Lake is present in Srinagar. See, there is one important fact about Srinagar which you need to remember. That is, recently Srinagar got included in the UNESCO's Creative Cities Network. So now let's briefly see about uh, this UNESCO's Creative Cities Network. See, uh, this UNESCO's Creative Cities Network, which is shortly known as the UCCN, was established in the year 2004. This uh, UCCN has actually developed a network of cities which has got some creativity as a strategic factor for the sustainable urban development. So the major core objective of UCCN is to facilitate the cooperation between these creative cities, and uh, this objective of facilitating the cooperation between the creative cities is achieved in two ways. So the first way is by exchanging the best practices in cultural life, and uh, this exchange is done at both national as well as at international level. So the second way in which this objective is achieved is by strengthening the platforms for the participation in the cultural life. Now here, both the national as well as the international platforms for cultural life are strengthened. Thus, this UCCN actually helps in advancing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So currently, there are 246 cities in this particular network, and these cities cover seven themes. And the seven themes are crafts and folk art, design, film, gastronomy, literature, media arts, and music. So by joining this network, cities are benefited from multi-level partnerships, and also UCCN benefits by creating a resilient future for the cities in the light of social, economic, and environmental issues. So this year, that is in 2021, Srinagar, which is the summer capital of Jammu and Kashmir, was added to UCCN, and Srinagar has been added under the theme crafts and Folk art, and remember, Srinagar is not the only uh, place in India to have a place in this list because there are also a few other Indian cities which are a part of this network, and these cities are Jaipur, Varanasi, Chennai, Mumbai, and Hyderabad. So the various themes under which the Indian cities are added in the UCCN are given here for your reference. So as you can see, Jaipur comes under. the crafts and folk arts and chennai and varanasi they come under the creative city of music and mumbai is for film and hyderabad is for gastronomy so you may wonder what is gastronomy right see actually this term gastronomy refers to the study of food and the culture so this is basically the science that studies the connection between the food the tradition and also the culture of a particular region or an area So with this, uh, let us wind up this discussion. So in this discussion, we saw about the Dal Lake, its unique features and significance, and uh, we also saw about the Shikara Rally that is in practice there. And then we moved on to see about the Sri Nagar and its inclusion in the UCCN. And we also had a basic understanding on what this UCCN, what are its objectives, and what they are actually trying to attain. Now, with these learnt points in mind, let us close this discussion, and uh, we will move on to the next news article. Now, look at this article. This article here is about an incident wherein the National Investigation Agency has approached the Supreme Court against the Bombay High Court order, and uh, the order was about granting default bail to the advocate and activist Sudha Bharadwaj. So, this is the uh, background in which this article is written. 
Now let's not worry about the issue there. Instead, we'll take this as an opportunity to learn on what is this default bail and also the various other dimensions of it like its provisions, its mandate, etc. So firstly, what is a default bail? See, default bail is nothing but a right to bail that accrues when the police fail to complete their investigation within a specified period in respect of a person in judicial custody. So this default bail is also known as statutory bail. So when you take the legal provisions of this bail, see this provision is enshrined in section 167 clause 2 of the code of criminal procedure so according to this section when it is not possible for the police to complete an investigation in 24 hours then the police can produce a suspect in court and seek orders for either police or judicial custody so this section concerns the total period up to which a person may be remanded in custody prior to the filing of charge sheet. See, the purpose of a charge sheet is to notify a person about the criminal charges that is or are being issued against him or her. So, after the charge sheet is filed, the person against whom the charge sheet has been filed comes to be known as an accused. And the filing of charge sheet with the magistrate indicates the starting or the commencement of criminal procedure. So by now, I hope you understood the meaning of default bail and also the legality of it. So now let's move on to see the time period within which the police has to complete investigation. See, for most cases, the police have 60 days in hand to complete the investigation and also to file a final report before the court. But however, uh, when the offence attracts death sentence or life imprisonment or even a jail term of not less than 10 years, then the period available will be 90 days. And at the end of this period, if the investigation is not complete, then the court shall release the person or the court shall grant them bail. See, there is one exception here. That is, though we saw that the maximum limit is 90 days, still it is not a fixed term. In the sense, this maximum limit varies with different laws. Now, say for example, under the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, the period or the maximum limit is 180 days. But then, in cases which are involving substances in commercial quantity, then the period may be extended up to one year. And this extension beyond 180 days can be granted only on a report by the public prosecutor, wherein the progress that was made in the investigation is indicated by the public prosecutor, indicating the progress made in the investigation and also by giving reasons to keep the accused in continued detention. Now, uh, apart from this, another example can be the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. So, under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, the default limit is 90 days only. So, the court may grant an extension of another 90 days. So, these two examples show that the extension of time is not automatic, but then it requires a judicial order. So finally, uh, we will wind up this article by saying about the principles that are laid down with regard to default bail. See, default is a right regardless of the nature of the crime. So the stipulated period within which the charge sheet has to be filed begins right from the day the accused is remanded for the first time. And it includes the days undergone in both police as well as judicial custody, but not the days which is spent in house arrest. So a requirement for the grant of a statutory bail is that the right should be claimed by the person in custody. So if the charge sheet is not filed within the stipulated period, and if there is no application for bail under section 167 clause 2, then there is no automatic bail. So these are the important points that, that were mentioned in this particular article. Now let's move on to the next news discussion. Now let us take up uh, this news article. See the news article here reports about a volcanic eruption that happened in the Mount Simeru. So in this context, let us briefly discuss about the volcanoes, its different types and also the related aspects. 
the syllabus covered by this article is here you can make a note of it see the mount simeru is one among the various active volcanoes in the east java see as we all know a volcano is a place where gases ashes and molten rock material or lava escape to the ground see a volcano is termed as an active volcano if the materials mentioned above are being released or have been released out in the recent past so remember mount simeru is the highest mountain on the island of java and it is often called as the mahameru by the locals which means a great mountain and this mountain lets out a huge cloud of steam or smoke every 20 minutes or so so we all know that the earth is structured in three layers right so the outermost solid layer is the crust the middle one is the mantle and the innermost layer is called as the core so the crust is brittle in nature and the thickness of this crust will vary from 0 to 100 km under the oceanic and continental areas remember oceanic crust is thinner when compared to that of the continental crust and the layer below the solid crust is called as mantle and this mantle has higher density than that of the crust and remember the mantle contains a weaker zone called the asthenosphere so it is from this zone only the molten rock materials find their way to the surface and the material in the upper mantle portion is called as magma so once this magma starts moving outside towards the crust or once it reaches the surface of the earth it is referred to as lava so the material that reaches the ground includes lava flows pyroclastic debris volcanic bombs ash and dust and also gases such as nitrogen compounds the sulfur compounds and also minor amounts of chlorine hydrogen and argon so uh, volcanoes are basically classified into five major types based on the nature of eruption and also based on the form that they have developed at the surface so the first type is shield volcanoes these are the largest of all the volcanoes on the earth and a classic example for this shield volcanoes are the hawaiian volcanoes see generally the shield volcanoes are made up of basalt which is actually a type of lava that is very fluid when erupted so it is for this reason these volcanoes are generally not steep note that these volcanoes become explosive if somehow water gets into their vent and apart from this or and otherwise they are generally characterized by low explosivity and the upcoming lava moves in the form of a fountain and it throws out the cone at the top of the vent and it develops into a cinder cone now the second type is composite volcanoes see the, these volcanoes are characterized by eruptions of cooler and also more viscous lavas when compared to that of basalt so these volcanoes they often result in explosive eruptions and along with lava large quantities of pyroclastic materials and also ashes found their way to the ground so this debris is generally collected near the vent openings resulting in the creation of strata which gives the mountains the appearance of composite volcanoes and coming to the third type which is caldera see these are the most explosive of the earth's volcanoes and uh, they are usually so explosive that uh, when they erupt they tend to collapse on themselves rather than building any tall structure so the collapsed depressions are called as calderas and their explosion indicates that the magma chamber supplying the lava is not only large but also nearby and coming to the fourth type that is the flood basalt provinces see these volcanoes outpour highly fluid lava that flows for long distances so some parts of the world are covered by thousands of square kilometers of this thick basalt lava flows and there can be a series of flows with some flows attaining thickness of more than 50 meter and individual flows may extend for hundreds of kilometers so the deccan traps from india which is presently covering most of the maharashtra plateau are a much larger flood basalt province 
and it is believed that initially the trap formations covers a much larger area than the present so coming to the final and the last type which is the mid ocean rich volcanoes see these volcanoes they occur in the oceanic areas and a structure of more than 70000 km long mid ocean ridges run through all of the ocean basins and this ridges core section is prone to frequent eruptions which are called as the mid ocean ridge volcanoes so far we saw about the volcanoes and their different types so now let's move on to see the pros and cons that are associated with volcanism let's start with the advantages of volcanoes so the first advantage is that they improve the land fertility see volcanoes help to create fertile land for us and the volcanic soil is actually highly fertile and it is also very productive for plants see the major reason for this is because the lava and the ash of volcanoes are enriched with minerals so once they are released they are taken up by the soil helping in plant growth and the volcanic soil has got a greater water retention compared to normal soil and it also has a high level of phosphorus which is really vital in plant growth now secondly it provides water to the atmosphere that is volcanoes help in providing the planet with water so to understand better about 75 to 95% of gases which are emitted upon the eruption of a volcano are water vapor thirdly volcanism provides sulfur see volcanoes they contribute a large amount of sulfur dioxide levels to the earth so as we know sulfur is the third most abundant mineral in the human body which helps to build proteins in humans as well as in various other organisms so this sulfur dioxide which is emitted from the volcanoes are preventing global temperatures from rising too high thereby slowing down 25% of global warming potential of the greenhouse gases from the 2000 to 2010 and then it also helps in carbon cycle regulation that is before humans started burning massive amounts of fossil fuels and before we were exceeding the planet's carbon limits these volcanoes played a, a very important role in contributing to the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere see carbon dioxide is one of the major reactants which are required by plants to carry out photosynthesis and lastly the volcanoes also provides a refuge for plants and animals due to their steep inclination now coming to the disadvantages see volcanoes are associated with wide scale destruction because the lava from these eruptions may flow into the city thereby causing massive infrastructure damage and deaths and many people have even suffered deaths due to volcanic blast and this may also lead to people being homeless requiring help and assistance for their survival next there is always a kind of fear regarding the volcanic eruption that is people may choose not to live near volcanoes as there is a constant fear of volcanoes erupting any time so therefore the area around the volcano may be devoid of humans despite being highly fertile and then these volcanoes they produce various gases so these gases are quite harmful if inhaled by humans and it also leads to various respiratory diseases such as asthma and these gases even at low levels may cause irritation to the eyes nose and also throat and when we get exposed to it at higher levels it can cause dizziness swelling headache as well as suffocation and the volcanic ash is also associated with various respiratory conditions such as asthma emphysema etc and silica which is a part of the volcanic ash causes silicosis if there is prolonged exposure and fourthly see all the volcanoes act as a carbon cycle regulators still the carbon dioxide gas is a major cause of the greenhouse effect which aggravates global warming and this has led to the various changes in the weather patterns around the region of volcanoes and finally volcanoes lead to habitat loss and destruction and the wildlife has been affected as well that is the volcanoes have caused habitat loss of various animals thereby causing them to look for new habitats in order to survive 
However, some may become fragmented due to difficulty in finding new habitats and eventually they end up being endangered. So just like humans, animals also fall victim to volcanic lava and the blast directly leading to their death. So these are some important exam re relevant points about volcano which we need to be knowing. So with this, let us wind up this discussion and we'll move on to see what the next news article has got to tell us. Now our next news discussion is going to be based on this OPED article. If you remember, following the nationwide lockdown towards the end of March, the Integrated Child Development Scheme, which was implemented at Anganwadis, was discontinued. So being closed since the April 2020 lockdown, these Anganwadis are now slowly reopening. And on that line, the Anganwadis in Karnataka, Bihar and Tamil Nadu are opening or considering uh, to open shortly. So, this particular article here is written in this background. Now, in this context, let us see about the Anganwadis, about the Integrated Child Development Scheme under which the Anganwadis come and also about the important points that are covered in this OPED article. The syllabus relevant for this article is here. You can just make a note of it. See, the word Anganwadi means courtyard shelter in Indian languages. So these Anganwadis or the courtyard shelters, they were started by the Indian government in the year 1975 and they were started as a part of the Integrated Child Development Services Program. So the basic idea or the basic objective behind this is to combat child hunger and also malnutrition and these Anganwadis, they serve as the focal point for the implementation of all the health, nutrition and the early learning initiatives under the Integrated Child Development Services. So, the Anganwadi Services, uh, which comes under the Umbrella Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, is a centrally sponsored scheme which aims at holistic development of children between 6 years of age and also the pregnant women and lactating mothers. See, the early childhood, that is the period from birth to about 5 years of age, is actually a crucial developmental window in the life of that particular child. So, as platforms for early childhood education and also nutritional support, these Anganwadis, they play an important role by aiding the children to achieve their potential. So, uh, knowing this, even the National Education Policy 2020 places Anganwadis at the center of the push to universalize the access to early childhood care and education. So, as I told you, these Anganwadis, they come under the Integrated Child Development Scheme. So, now let's briefly see about this ICDS. See, the ICDS or the Integrated Child Development Scheme is the umbrella scheme. See, in the year 1974, India adopted a well-defined national policy for children. So, following this policy, it was decided to start a holistic, multi-centric program with a compact package of services and this decision led to the formation of the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, which is shortly known as the ICDS Scheme. So, this ICDS was launched on the 2nd of October in the year 1975. It is one of the flagship programs of our Indian government and it represents one of the world's largest and also an unique program for early childhood care and development. So, the beneficiaries under the scheme are children between the years 0 and 6 and also pregnant women and lactating mothers. So, this scheme was launched as a response to the challenge of providing the preschool non-formal education on one hand and also to break vicious cycle of malnutrition, morbidity, reduced learning capacity and also mortality on the other. So, these two were the core areas which this particular scheme wanted to address. See, this ICDS is a centrally sponsored scheme as we saw earlier. So, this scheme is anchored by the Ministry of Women and Child Development and it is implemented by the state governments and union territories. The various objectives of the scheme are given below for your reference. So, please have a look at it. Remember, six services are provided under the scheme. And they are supplementary nutrition, preschool and non-formal education, nutrition and health education, 
immunization health checkup and also referral services so these are the six services which are provided under the scheme see among these six services the last three services that is immunization health checkup and referral services are related to health and they are provided by the ministry or the department of health and family welfare through the national rural health mission and health system so uh, by now i hope you have a fair understanding about the anganwadi is a major objective and also the integrated child development scheme under which this anganwadi is come see according to the national family health survey five data in 2019 to 20 only less than 15% of the 5 year olds that is the children between 0 to 5 years attended any pre primary school see the most important aim of the anganwadi program today are to prepare the children between the years 1 to 5 for entry into the primary school in order to improve their health by providing nutrition rich food and they also aim at increasing their school attendance but then this pattern got severely disrupted due to the pandemic so now in this editorial the author here has put forward certain challenges that are there in this anganwadi system which has to be seriously focused so now let's see the various points that were put forward by the author here see despite being the primary information source on nutrition the anganwadi workers are found to lack the key knowledge and this was found by the studies that were conducted in delhi and bihar see the surveys that were conducted in 2018 to 19 found that among the mothers listed with anganwadi workers the knowledge about the key health behavior such as the complementary feeding and also the hand washing were found to be very low another challenge is that the anganwadi workers they often do not have the required support or the kind of training to provide early childhood or the early children education and the core services like preschool education are found to be deprioritized for instance a typical worker was found to spend an estimated 10% of their time which is actually 28 minutes per day on preschool education compared to the recommended daily 120 minutes so that means 120 minutes was the prescribed or the recommended timing for a typical worker to spend on preschool education but what they are actually spending is only 10% of their time which is just equal to 28 minutes this is one uh, shortcoming with the anganwadi workers which has to be seriously focused and mitigated see another major challenge is that the anganwadis often lack adequate infrastructure and even niti ayog found that only 59% of anganwadis had adequate seating for children and workers and in fact more than half of them were unhygienic Following this the author has also provided some good and useful insights on how to improve the efficacy of these anganwadis so now let's see them one by one see the studies that were carried out in odisha and andhra pradesh and even the study is carried out globally have found that home visits where volunteers work with children and caregivers were found to significantly improve the cognition language the motor development and also the nutritional intake of the children while reducing stunting so this uh, practice can be encouraged or implemented in an holistic manner and secondly many states will have to improve their career incentives and also the remuneration for the anganwadi workers so one way to ensure that they have more time is to hire additional workers at anganwadis and even a recent study in tamil nadu found that an additional worker devoted to preschool education led to cost effective gains in both learning and nutrition and apart from this uh, linking anganwadis and primary schools to strengthen the convergence as well as expanding the duration of day care at anganwadis have also showed improvement and further the reaching out to women during pregnancy can also increase the likelihood that their children use the icds services so to conclude 
as the world's largest provider of early childhood services these anganwadis actually perform a crucial role in contributing to life outcomes of children across india so therefore to improve these outcomes there is a huge need for us to invest more significantly in anganwadis and also to roll out the proven innovative interventions so these are the important points discussed by the author here so with this let us wind up this article discussion and we'll move on to see what the next news article has got to tell us now our next news discussion is going to be based on this data point article which talks about the rise of anemia among children so now keeping the data point aside let us take this as an opportunity to revise our learnings on anemia see according to the world health organization anemia is a condition in which the number of red blood cells or the hemoglobin concentration within the red blood cells is lower than normal see hemoglobin is an iron containing protein in the red blood cells so this hemoglobin is needed to carry oxygen throughout our body so now let's briefly see about the various causes of anemia see anemia can be caused by certain deficiencies such as iron deficiency vitamin b12 deficiency folate deficiency etc and apart from this it is also caused due to the destruction of red blood cells earlier than normal see the red blood cells they generally last between 90 and 120 days so this is called as the normal condition of the life of the red blood cells so what happens is that after this time period the old red blood cells will get destructed by our body and once again the bone marrow will make more new red blood cells so maybe due to the destructions of red blood cells earlier than normal can also lead to anemia then the third reason can be a long term chronic disease such as the chronic kidney disease the cancer the ulcerative colitis or even rheumatoid arthritis and uh, sometimes anemia are also caused due to inherited diseases such as thalassemia or sickle cell anemia and even the loss of blood during pregnancy and heavy menstrual periods can also result in anemia and uh, apart from all these anemia can also be caused due to the problems with bone marrow such as lymphoma leukemia myelodysplasia multiple myeloma or aplastic anemia now coming to the symptoms so generally the persons having mild anemia may feel fatigue or dizzy or they even have shortness of breath and they may also have a loss of appetite and they even feel numb at times so apart from these basic symptoms uh, some popular symptoms that a person will experience when anemia gets worse are given below for your reference so you can just have a glance through it so some of the symptoms depict uh, displayed when the anemia gets worse includes the blue color to the whites of the eyes the brittle nails then pale skin color the desire to eat high or other non food things and then also the light headedness when you stand up and the shortness of breath with mild activity or even sore or inflamed tongue and mouth ulcers and also the abnormal or increased menstrual bleeding in females and even the loss of sexual desire in male so now coming to the treatment of anemia say so anemia may be treated by blood transfusion it may also be treated by giving corticosteroids or other medicines that suppress the immune system so generally this is done to prevent the early destruction of the red blood cells apart from this anemia can also be treated by giving a medicine called erythropoietin and uh, this medicine actually helps the bone marrow to make more blood cells in our body and lastly it can also be treated by giving supplements of iron vitamin b12 folic acid or even other minerals and vitamins and a most important point to be noted here is that the treatment for anemia should be based on the cause of anemia so these are the important points about anemia that we need to have in mind whenever we learn about anemia so with this let us wind up the article discussion for today and uh, we'll move on to the next part of our indo news analysis which is the practice question discussion now look at this question consider the following statements regarding default bail statement 1 
a right to bail that is opted when the police fail to complete investigation within a specified period statement 2 the time period within which police has to complete investigation is fixed at 90 days. So, we need to find the correct statement here. So, when you take the first statement, this statement is correct because the statement given here is the definition of a default bail. See, default bail is nothing but a right to bail that accrues when the police fail to complete investigation within a specified period in respect of a person in judicial custody. So, another name for default bail is statutory bail. Now, coming to the second statement, now based on our discussion, we can easily conclude that this statement is incorrect because the time period within which the police has to complete investigation is not fixed. In the sense, it varies with the conditions of the different crimes and laws. For most offences, the police have 60 days to complete the investigation and to file a final report before the court. But however, in situations where the offence attracts death sentence or you know life imprisonment or a jail term of not less than 10 years, then the period available is 90 days. And in the cases of Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, this period is till 100 and extended till 180 days but then and in cases involving substances in commercial quantity the period may be extended up to one year and even in the case of the unlawful activities prevention act the default limit is 90 days only and the court may actually grant an extension of another 90 days so to just put it simply the time period is not fixed and it varies with laws and crimes so that means only the first statement given here is right and since only the first statement is right the correct answer here would be option a that is one only now look at this question consider the following statements with reference to unesco creative cities network statement one the only indian city included in the uccn is srinagar statement two srinagar was added to uccn under the theme crafts and folk art See, actually the first statement given here is incorrect because as we saw in the discussion, Srinagar is not the only city uh, which is included in the UCCN list because along with Srinagar, there is also five other cities which are included in the UCCN. And these five cities are Jaipur, Varanasi, Chennai, Hyderabad and Mumbai. So, the first statement is incorrect. And when you take the second statement, this case statement is correct because in 2021, Srinagar was added to UCCN under the theme Crafts and Folk Art. So, since only the second statement is correct here, the right answer here would be option B, that is 2 only. Now, look at this question. Consider the following statements with reference to anemia. Statement 1, the lifespan of our red blood cells is only one week statement two anemia in children is caused only due to iron deficiency so we need to find the right statement see when you take the first statement it is incorrect because the normal lifespan of the red blood cells is 90 to 120 days so the first statement is incorrect now coming to the second statement see anemia in children may also be caused due to other deficiency say like that of vitamin b12 deficiency or mineral deficiency or at times it can even be caused due to inheritance so therefore iron deficiency is one of the cause but it is not the only cause of anemia in children so that makes the second statement incorrect so the right answer here is option d because both the statements given here are incorrect the list of main practice questions is given here Please write your answers and post them in the comment section. So with this, let us wind up our discussion for today. If my video was useful to you, then please don't hesitate to like, comment and share. And do subscribe to Ashankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates regarding UPSC Civil Services Preparation. Thank you.